Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, you make days and seasons for celebration. This Thanksgiving season reminds us to be thankful and grateful for all those who for over 50 years have contributed to this assembly of God's creation in the Jerica Suki Museum. We include Father Hillary, Father Edmund, Father Theodore, but also the other Abbey monks. We ask your continued blessings on Carly, our curator, as well as the student workers, volunteers, and visitors. There are so many, including the museum's board of directors and education directors, who have provided guidance and support. We remember too those who creatively and selflessly contribute and have contributed to the building and maintaining of this gem of natural history education at Benedictine University. On this anniversary, our contributors and donors also have given their skill and time so generously. That's well known. Father, bless them all. May those many who have used and will use the museum be rewarded for their efforts. Even when floods come rushing down or polar bears migrate across a parking lot, may we always be mindful of and respectful of these gifts you have given us. May the small symphony of creation make us joyful as we give you thanks. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Darwin Day at Benedictine University. I'm Dr. Al Martin, uh, Professor Emeritus of Biology, and we welcome you to our campus in this celebration. For nearly a decade, the Department of Biological Sciences has been celebrating Darwin Day, and we do a variety of things. Um, we have several faculty members give presentations, we have some student events, the museum has some displays, relevant to Darwin. And then we are honored to have a guest speaker um, who talks about his or her research and interests and how they relate to Darwin's work. Darwin Day at Benedictine is an educational outreach program um, of the Department of Biological Sciences and uh, the Jerika Suki Nature Museum. So what is Darwin Day all about? Well, on uh, November 24th, 1859, uh, Darwin's book on the origin of species uh, hit the bookstores. There were 1,250 copies. And they sold out on one day. And Darwin immediately triggered um, a controversy. Uh, he was the most praised and most damned man in England and then the day after in Europe. And so what was this controversy about? Well, there were two aspects. One was religious. Many people saw um, Darwin's work as being antithetical to the uh, biblical accounts of creation. And the other had to do with the mechanism that he proposed. This was among the scientists. Um, the, so this is the controversy he triggered. Um, the religious controversy still continues to this day, but it's actually rather minor. The fact is that mainstream religious groups, Catholic Church, Protestant churches, uh, Judaism, uh, these mainstream religious groups all have realized that evolution is science and that um, they have no problem with this. It's the rather right wing area of Christianity that's mainly in opposition. As far as the scientific opposition to Darwinian evolution, it had to do with mechanism. Darwin proposed uh, that evolution occurs, organism change over time, and the uh, mechanism was called natural selection. And what do we mean by natural selection? What we mean is that the environment in which organisms live, which populations live, control uh, essentially which genes will be successful. Um, Darwin came up with a set of postulates uh, 
based upon his intense observations of nature, of animals and plants. And he said that, pop, that animals and populations are genetically programmed to reproduce. Okay, so they reproduce, they reproduce, they reproduce. They produce more individuals, more offspring than can possibly survive. Okay, however, these individuals uh, are not identical. There's a lot of variation with regard to just about every trait. For example, color, height, beak size in birds and so forth. And uh, these variations are controlled genetically uh, due to genes. Okay, so the idea of natural selection that Darwin discovered um, is that um, some variants in the population, some of these genetic variants are better adapted at surviving the demands of the environment than others. And if the environment changes, then a different set of um, uh, individuals with slightly different genes would have an advantage. So let's give it an example, say beak size in birds. Suppose you have a population of birds and they vary in beak size. Um, some have thin beaks, small beaks, uh, some have medium beaks, some have heavy, heavy beaks. And the environment favors the production of plants that have heavy seeds. Well, who has the advantage? Well, of course, birds with smaller beaks have a harder time picking up, crushing, eating seeds. They get fewer seeds in a certain amount of time, whereas, uh, whereas uh, the birds with the larger beaks uh, take in more food, more energy, which they channel into reproduction. So they reproduce more often, more successfully. So overall, there are more heavy, heavier beak birds in the next generation. This is called natural selection. Okay, now the reason this was controversial among scientists in Darwin's time is that scientists were proposing some other mechanisms as well. The idea of evolution was actually quite well known before Darwin. Uh, Darwin uh, essentially studied very intensely a number of uh, natural history situations, and this is how he came up with the idea of evolution. And he also found a lot of convincing evidence, overwhelming evidence for it. Scientists were fine with that, but the question was, is it natural selection? What's the mechanism? For example, some scientists thought it might be mutation. Well, in the years since Darwin, it's been clearly shown by uh, research that Darwin was right. Natural selection is the basic, the main mechanism uh, of the evolutionary process. Okay, so that is no longer controversial. So the question is, why are we uh, having Darwin Day and celebrating Darwin Day? And to say this is an, an educational outreach program to our campus and beyond the campus, um, because a lot of people simply don't understand what Darwin discovered, what Darwin was about, what Darwin has to teach us. But it goes deeper than that, is it turns out that evolution by natural selection is the basic framework of the science of biology. As biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky once said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Now, every science has a framework, a unifying concept that unites all the various uh, facts and laws and discoveries. Otherwise, it's just a hodgepodge of information. Every science has this unifying factor, this unifying network. Uh, and in biology, it turns out to be evolution. So there is no science of biology without an understanding of evolution. And a lot of people don't understand this. Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Novak Acho, a professor of biological sciences. And today I want to congratulate the museum on 50 years and continued another 500, and to argue why museums are so incredibly important for the study of biological diversity. Most people are aware that museums are really wonderful public education centers, um, but most of the specimens that museums store are not on display. They're, they're to be stored and archived and protected uh, for future generations in principle forever. Um, and they're behind the scenes. These are pictures of the, the enormous collections for the, the nation's museum at the Smithsonian. Um, but the Jerikasuki Nature Museum also has really amazing and large, vast 
specimens on um, that are in, in their storage areas. And they're increasingly working on a project to digitize or make all that uh, information available online. And so here they've been working on eggs and plants and fossils, and they have more than 3,000 specimens. And I don't think any of these specimens are on display. They're in storage. And you can see that based on the years here, some of these have been collected really 150 years ago, back to the, the late 1800s. One of the most important roles that museums play, and the Jurikasuka Nature Museum doesn't do this, although the, the whale specimen might actually be one, is museums store what's called a type specimen. And a type specimen is a special set of specimens. Historically, it was one, like the ideal best specimen. Um, but increasingly, we recognize there's a lot of variation between juveniles and adults and among different members of a population and different populations and males and females that today when biologists collect new species or potentially new species they designate um, a set of specimens as what's called a type specimen and then what happens is that specimen that's used in the basis of a scientific publication is by rule stored in a museum where it can be studied by future biologists um, essentially forever so if you find for example, a bird that looks like this and you collect it on the Galapagos Islands and you think it's one of the species that was collected by Darwin in 1835 on his voyage around the world on the HMS Beagle, you could go to the British Museum, you could actually look at the original specimens that he didn't name them, but a, another ornithologist, a, somebody who studies birds, um, later studied those and recognized that these were different species. And there on the tags, it says collected by C. Darwin. And you can go to that reference by Gould and look at the page number and read the original description, compare it with the specimen. And if the specimen you collected matches this, then you've 100% confirmed that it's this, the same species. But if it's different, Different, then you know your species is something new. And so this is a really important role whenever a biologist names a species is to store a set of specimens in the type specimens. And they are the, by far the most valuable specimens in a museum because they're the basis of what every species that's been given a name is done with. Our museum on campus has a bunch of really important specimens. Um, there are many species that have gone extinct um, in human lifetime. And in some cases, humans have collected specimens and named them and stored them in museums. And so here on the left, uh, our museum on campus has several specimens of passenger pigeon, um, which were by any measure the most abundant species of bird anywhere on earth. They're native to the North American Midwest through Southeast. And there were literally billions of birds on this continent in enormous flocks that the flocks, when they would fly overhead, literally would turn the sky dark because the flock would stretch for miles. And it was such a dense flock of birds that you wouldn't be able to see the sun through the birds. Um, the last one went extinct in 1901 in the wild. And then uh, a famous bird survived until 1914, dying in Cincinnati at the Cincinnati Zoo named Martha. We also have uh, the only native kind of most northerly parakeet in North America. It's called the Carolina parakeet. It was more native to the kind of southeast, the Carolinas, um, but it did extend out of that area. The last one of this really beautiful species, and we have several specimens in our museum, um, went extinct in 1919, was the last time they were seen in the wild. And then at the same Cincinnati Zoo, um, in really the same area where Martha, the last passenger pigeon, survived the last surviving Carolina parakeet. And so if you want to see an extinct species, museums store them um, of things that were alive when, in many cases, our great grandparents were alive. Um, in some cases, things that went extinct in the last decade are also uh, preserved there as well. We can go back in time to much older things that have been extinct for millions of years. And here I'm going to show you just some of the research I've done with students, um, undergraduate students, working with museum specimens. So scientists have known that body size in a lot of groups of life increase over time. And here you can see some representatives of, of a group of life called brachiopods. And a student named Adam Lanier and I, um, in the, the mid-2000s, um, measured a, a, a lot of specimens of these spanning over about 150 million years from about 500 million years ago until about 350 million years ago, and saw that, as expected, um, body size increased in these marine animals through that time. But 
by collecting the data, we were able to establish the rate at which they evolved, how much they evolved, and so it went from a kind of a descriptive sense or an intuitive sense to a very well-documented increase. It's a substantial increase in body size. Um, Benedictine student Kaoki Burton and I, in the early 2010s, uh, were working with some museum specimens from the Field Museum. This is a weird snail that's kind of flat on the bottom and kind of rounded on top, and actually in the middle is hollow. Um, and we measured using something called morphometrics, where you very carefully kind of use geometry and math to measure shape. Uh, measured a lot of these specimens and found that the way that a baby, one of these snails, lived um, was very, very different than when it became a mature adult. Um, and you can kind of see that. The inner circles um, show that this snail was kind of a somewhat normal snail, had a round shell kind of interior, but as it got older and older and older, the shape of the shells got more oblong and almost kind of rectangular. And so as it got bigger and bigger, and these snails could be in some cases, six to 12 inches in diameter. Um, they were just too big to move around anymore and probably changed to live more like an oyster as a filter feeder. And we could measure that to, to demonstrate how those body sizes correlated with changes in their ecology. A really wonderful study um, also done um, here at Benedictine University was done by our Dr. Tischler, um, who mostly works with microbiology stuff, but also has a lot of interest and background in environmental science. And our museum has a lot of specimens of bird eggs, as you saw earlier, going back to the 1800s. And so working with some colleagues that she knows um, and is very friendly with at Argonne National Lab, um, they have a really wonderful and super incredibly expensive piece of equipment called x-ray fluorescence um, that basically uses that whole big kind of sends beams of I'm assuming electricity I don't know all the technical physical details but through that whole big circle and they brought some eggs in with some undergraduate students um, of predators eagles ospreys falcons um, and the eggs were deposited or produced by the bird in the late 1800s when the, the bird was still alive. Um, and one of the neat things about bird eggs is that the chemistry of the bird egg really reflects the blood chemistry of the bird that laid the egg. And so using this equipment in very careful procedures, we're able to demonstrate that these predators in the late 1800s were exposed in their environment to arsenic and some pretty awful toxic uh, elements and that more recent birds um, aren't showing that, which shows that the laws largely in the 20th century to, to reduce contamination and, and pollution um, have been really wonderful. One of the great things about this study is it not only is using our, our really historically important archive of eggshells, um, but it also doesn't damage the eggshells. Again, one of the primary rules of a museum is to protect and store the specimens so they can be used in the future. And if you need to destruct, destroy the, the specimens in order to work with that, that's usually a, a not very good thing. Um, another example um, at the Field Museum is uh, McCormick Place, that enormous building right on the lakefront, um, is a big building and birds, especially when they're migrating, will fly into it and actually die. And since the 1970s, museum workers and a lot of volunteers have gone out during the, the peak migrations and collected the birds that have died. They have over 100,000 birds. At the time, they were just trying to collect specimens and build their, their specimens. but Recently, they've started looking back at that rich arsenal of data to figure out what it says. And what they've demonstrated is that birds within our lifetime, um, within the last 50 years, have evolved smaller body sizes, presumably because of climate change. A bigger body handles heat differently than a smaller bottle, body. And then also they found out they could correlate the bird deaths with um, electrical use and storms and moons and found that if they don't have conventions and they turn the lights off in McCormick Place, you have on average 60% less bird deaths. And so that's an important thing if you're building a, a skyscraper or just any building to, to consider um, the, the impact of your electrical usage and your light production can impact um, organisms. So with that, I just wanted to show some examples of the value of museums, um, that there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and can be useful for all kinds of future studies, even those that weren't anticipated by the people that 
originally collected the specimens. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert McCarthy, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today in celebration of Darwin Day at Benedictine University. As you already know, this year is an especially auspicious celebration since it marks the 50th year anniversary of what is now known as the Jirikasuki Nature Museum, which was founded in 1971. The museum was not always in its current location, nor was it even a museum to start. It started out as the teaching collection of the Jerika brothers, who were both monks at St. Procopius Abbey, but also brothers in real life. Father Hillary, who you can see here on the left of this slide, taught botany and other ecology type courses. Uh, Benedictine. He was the first American Benedictine monk to receive a PhD from a secular university. He received his PhD in biology at the University of Chicago in 1922. Father Edmund, who's shown here on the right, uh, received his PhD four years later in 1926. Uh, also from the University of Chicago, and he taught zoology, anatomy, physiology, those types of courses. The two of them were avid collectors of fossils and zoological specimens, among other things, and they traded specimens with natural history museums, most prominently the Field Museum in Chicago. They were avid naturalists, and they were a little bit quirky too. So for instance, uh, Father Edmund used to have a pet raccoon and they used to play uh, practical jokes using natural history specimens. It sounds like Benedictine was a fun place to be at, uh, back then. In this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on one particular specimen uh, at the Jerika Suki Nature Museum, uh, the gorilla Bushman. And uh, Bushman was captured or rescued, depending on how you wanna think about it, in Africa uh, when he was a juvenile, very young. Uh, he was nursed by a missionary family, sold to the Lincoln Park Zoo, and then spent his life in captivity in the zoo. Uh, his body was donated to the Field Museum, and his skeleton is now in the collections of the Jerika Suki Nature Museum. So you can see his, at least part of his skeleton was on display. It's no longer on display because it's under study, but it will be back on display at some point, probably pretty soon. The taxidermic pelt and reconstruction of Bushman is currently on display at the ground level of the Field Museum across from the Crown Family Play Lab. Um, and it's a very popular exhibit. Uh, people always go to it. You always see kids in front of it. It's a gigantic gorilla, as you'll appreciate in this talk. Uh, Bushman's story is well known and very well documented. That's really what happens when museum workers and ar archivists set their mind to a task, they do a great job of it. The Field Museum in particular maintains a thorough archive of information on Bushman's life and death. So there's a lot of information online. So most of the story is, is out there. Um, and so you could see there's, there's just a lot of information and the Field Museum, museum curates uh, a lot of it, most of it. A lesser known fact, uh, is that H Father Hillary served on the board of the Field Museum and traded specimens with the curators there and the preparators, uh, including specimens of mammal skulls and bones in particular. Um, once uh, the archivists and, and uh, taxidermists and curators were done using Bushman's bones to prepare the, pr the taxidermy mount, uh, the Field Museum wasn't very interested at that point in keeping the skeleton, and so they traded with Father Hillary. And before anybody asked me the question, uh, the record of what was traded for the, the for the skeleton of of Bushman is is lost. I, I don't know what that is. I don't think anybody knows what that is. Um, but uh, we have the, the skeleton, including the skull, uh, and then the Field Museum has the taxidermy pelt. <laughs> Bushman was a Western lowland gorilla from Cameroon. He was found as an infant, so his parents were uh, presumably killed by poachers. Uh, and then he was given to a missionary family and nursed and raised by this missionary family for about two years, at which point he was sold to a buyer who then sold him to the Lincoln Park Zoo, which was just starting up around that point. Uh, Western lowland gorillas 
are very closely related to us. So by current count, they share something like 98.3% of the same genetic code, the same genetic code that, that we have, that humans have. There's still about uh, somewhere between 100,000 at the low end and 360,000 at the high end of Western lowland gorillas still in the wild, um, which is an astonishingly small number. Um, it might be as high as 360,000, but 100,000 would be especially astonishingly low. And that's the value you most often see on the internet. Um, either way, uh, Western lowland gorillas and, and gorillas in general are uh, critically endangered. So they have a critically endangered status. Their numbers have declined by about 65% in the last 20 years. So their population is just bottoming out. They're the most common gorilla in zoos, but still there's several hundred in zoos. Uh, and so they're, they're really a, an endangered species. Bushman is one of the largest gorillas ever to be kept in captivity. So he's very especially large for a gorilla. Gorillas are, are gigantic, but he's especially gigantic. Uh, he was about six foot two, six feet two tall uh, when he was standing up fully upright, uh, which he did sometimes. Um, and just under 600 pounds in, uh, toward the end of his life, um, something like 585, 595 pounds. Uh, gorillas generally don't get this large in the wild. So the largest documented wild gorilla from the Cameroon is uh, six foot, six foot one, but mostly gorillas are cited as being somewhere around five foot nine or five foot 10. Um, and they certainly don't get to be 600 pounds in the wild. So they get to be 300, 350, a 400 pound gorilla would be really large in the wild. So he was just gigantic. One of the Ringling Brothers at one point visited him and admitted that Bushman was larger in all respects compared to their gigantic gorilla that they had, Gargantua, who was a circus gorilla, who they fed so that he would grow to be gigantic. Um, so, so Bushman was an exceedingly large gorilla. He was uh, initially allowed out of his cage to play with his attendant, Eddie Robinson, until the age of six. Uh, when he refused to go back into his cage. And after that point, he simply wasn't allowed out of his cage. He spent the rest of his life in a cage, except for one three hour period, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, eventually this cage was expanded uh, to a suite of cages, which included a large cage, a small cage, and an outdoor cage. And you can see those here. So you can see that his outdoor cage was somewhat larger. Um, and there's another view of his outdoor cage, but this is what his indoor cage looked like. Um, he, uh, the cage initially had a wooden floor. He injured himself on the wooden floor. Uh, it was then replaced with polished concrete. Um, and so that's how he lived his life in, in, in a caged condition, unfortunately. Um, one uh, period toward the end of his life, uh, he escaped for three hours. That's what I was referring to. Uh, just a minute ago. Unfortunately, the way he did it is that he bit his longtime keeper and his buddy since, you know, he was, he, he came to the zoo and he was two years old and played with him until he was six. Uh, but he bit his keeper uh, on the forearm, required uh, some stitches, uh, and then he was roaming around the hallway. And so here's a newspaper article. This was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. It was in other newspapers. He basically roamed around his enclosure, uh, in all the back hallways and the kitchen. Uh, and he, he was just, you know, he's just roaming around. They could not get him back into his cage and it took about three hours. They tried to put uh, an alligator on a rope in there, which scared him a little bit, but not sufficiently to get back into the cage. And then finally, uh, the, the, uh, the director of the zoo um, decided that uh, he would be scared of snakes, which he was. So he put a two foot garter snake uh, under the door and it uh, scared uh, Bushman sufficiently that they were then able to shoo him back into uh, the cage. And that was the last time that he was out of his cage. Um, so he was at large, in other words, both large and at large. Um, after his death, Bushman was bequeathed, donated to the Field Museum, 
the deal was worked out uh, between the director of the, the zoo and the field museum. So here's an, a, a letter, again, archivists and, and people working at museums, just great for the details, um, making this deal, um, saying that, you know, uh, maybe kept for Chicago as a mounted specimen, probably the finest in America, uh, and then for scientific purposes as well, which it has been. Um, Bushman eventually then died uh, just a little bit later from what I was talking about um, on January 1st in 1951. Um, he had been sick for the year previous. Um, he had heart disease, he had arth arthritis, various other uh, issues uh, undoubtedly caused by uh, zoo conditions at that time, um, uh, including diet. Um, when it was known, it was reported that he was he was very sick and he might not last too long. Uh, he had 120,000 visitors on a single day in June. So that was right before uh, he, he succumbed in January in 1951. Um, he rallied a little bit and then wound up passing away on the 1st of January. Uh, he was called the most outstanding animal of any zoo in the world and the most valuable. At one time, he was valued alive at $250,000. I'm not even sure what that would be in 1951 uh, currency, but a lot more than $250,000 today, that's for sure. Um, he was called the best known and most popular civic figure in Chicago. Um, and he was Chicago's gorilla, right? Uh, he would do things and they would appear in the newspaper, not only in Chicago, but around the United States. <clears throat> At the Field Museum, uh, Leon Wal Walters and other taxidermists, artists, and sculptors painstakingly reconstructed his body and to do that, they developed new techniques, which are some of which are still used today to reconstruct, for instance, his hands, his feet, and his face in celluloid. Um, so Bushman is historically important, not only for his life in Chicago, he was a popular figure at the time, but also for the taxidermy techniques that were developed uh, and still used today to create such a lifelike reconstruction. So here you can see three different stages in that reconstruction. Uh, you can see filling the skeleton out. So they did use the skeleton and they built everything on top of the skeleton. Um, they sculpted a body for him and then they completed it by, you know, using some sorts of art artistry, right? Um, uh, you could see that they painstakingly molded the hands and the feet and the face. Um, they worked to put, you know, hair on and everything. It's really just painstaking work, no doubt about that. Um, and, you know, way ahead of its time. Uh, and these are taxidermic te techniques that are still used today. Um, uh, this process has been exceedingly well documented, as, as again, you might expect for archivists and, and people who work at museums. Um, uh, there's video footage, if you want to look at that on the web. Uh, the Field Museum maintains a lot of what exists in terms of uh, archival photos, pictures, uh, and other resources. And so you can see those resources here. Um, this process is continuing uh, because the taxidermy mount requires uh, refreshing and restoring from time to time because it degrades. Um, and so almost every time it gets cleaned up, there, there's another news article about it. So this is, you know, important, uh, you know, thing in the history of of taxidermy and museum studies. I should note that before I talk about the, the bones that are uh, at the Jirikasuki Nature Museum, that there, uh, there is uh, one bone that is at the Field Museum. This is the only bone about which there's a, a written report, a, a scientific study of its size and shape. Um, and that is the baculum. So the baculum is the penis bone that some animals have, not humans. Uh, but uh, gorillas and other great apes have a baculum. Uh, so this is the baculum of Bushman, okay? It's about five millimeters by three millimeters. Um, this is a publication that's from 1951 in uh, Fildiana Zoology, which is an internal field museum, but well-respected journal that used to exist. Um, and uh, it, 
it's a report of the baculum of the gorilla. And so in this case, the gorilla was, the two gorillas were uh, a mountain gorilla, gorilla beringii, uh, and a Western lowland gorilla. And so that was, that was Bushman. Well, Bushman's baculum looked uh, different than the bacula of other gorillas. And so not just the one that was in this report, but ones that have been reported since. Um, and it's clear that this is probably pathological for some reason that that really hasn't been worked out yet. I don't know that anybody's thought about that in regards to, to Bushman's baculum in particular. Um, but that's this is a, a, significant, um, a significant scientific paper um, for studying the baculum of the gorilla. Uh, that's the only bone that the Jirikasuki Nature Museum does not have. So that's still at the Field Museum. I was able to take a look at that when I was there. Um, at the Jirikasuki Nature Museum, uh, the rest of the skeleton is there, including uh, the skull. And uh, so you can see the skull right here. I can tell you just by uh, looking at it without going any further that this looks much different than skulls of other uh, Western lowland gorillas. And so there's just some obvious differences like with the brow ridge and the shape of the brain case and the, the region where the neck muscles are, the nuchal region and the way the face is positioned and the teeth are positioned. And so it just does look different. Um, the limb bones uh, also look a bit different. So they're a little bit less curved than they would be in the wild. They also have different proportions. So that's something we're studying at Benedictine in the morphometrics lab that I run, uh, co-run. Um, in terms of uh, the skull in the cranium, um, we're comparing Bushman's skull to the skulls of wild gorilla. So this is the skull of a wild gorilla. And you can see that it's a CT scan of the skull of a wild gorilla that's been reconstructed three-dimensionally. Um, you can see that this skull, this cranium is much more linear. So it has a much more projecting or prognathic face. Um, and that the, the brain case and the region where the neck muscles attach looks much different okay, than it does in Bushman. Um, this might be due to the different diet that uh, that gorillas are given that fed in zoos or at least were fed in zoos. So nowadays gorillas eat more of the things that they would naturally eat in the wild. Um, but back then uh, they would eat very soft foods. They would eat human foods. They would eat cooked foods, including cooked meats like steaks. Um, and so those are not things that, that Bushmen would have eaten in the wild, that gorillas normally eat in the wild. Um, they, uh, you know, animals that eat those sorts of soft foods don't produce the same uh, stresses and strains, the same forces that would be produced in the wild eating harder foods or, or foods that are tougher to eat, like more fibrous foods. Um, and so uh, this is one reason that, that there might be a difference. Another could be uh, nutrition, um, it could be health, it could be things related to being in zoo conditions. Uh, he was not as active in the zoo as he would have been in the wild. Um, he had heart condition, which uh, at least partially was probably due to uh, the captive conditions. Um, but Bushman's face was more, I, I guess, the, the sort of non-scientific way to say it would be squashed in. It's kind of like squashed, whereas a wild gorilla's face is, is more projecting, okay? Um, and so we're starting to study this in uh, the morphometrics lab. So this is research uh, I've done in collaboration with a research student, Asba Musani, who's uh, now a senior health science major. Um, and she uh, was a participant in the 2021 uh, Natural Science Summer Research Program just this past summer. So we started to look at the size and shape of the skull in different uh, species and subspecies of gorillas, wild gorillas, in preparation for looking uh, at the skull of, of Bushmen. So that's that's a, a bit of it that we, we have yet to do. Uh, we're also looking at the uh, postcranial skeleton in the morphometrics lab. Um, one aspect of this study is to study pathology. So when the skeleton doesn't look the way that it should look, um, we can identify, for example, abnormal bone growth that's related to osteoarthritis. And we know that Bushman did suffer from arthritis. And so this is gratifying to see that we can identify it in the skeleton. Um, this is especially evident 
in the foot. And so these are some bones of the foot, including the large bone that's in the heel that you walk on. Um, and there's some extra bone growth there that is abnormal, pathological. Um, also in the metatarsal bones that are in the foot, you can see there's some ridges there that are the result of uh, arthritis, osteoarthritis. There's also a, a, a few signs of it in, in the hand, but not to the same extent. Um, these might be because of locomotor differences. So Bushman was walking on uh, a hard concrete floor for most of his, his life in the zoo. Um, also not being able to be active, as active as uh, he would be in the wild. Um, and so it's, it's possible that there were some differences in how he knuckle walked around. So gorillas, knuckle, they walk on their, on their knuckles. Um, and so there might've been some differences uh, of how a gorilla would do it in the wild and do it in, in a zoo, a knuckle walk in a zoo. Um, there uh, also are just some unexpected things that we discovered. So after looking at Bushman's ulna, which is one of the two bones that's in the forearm, I noticed that Bushman had a plug of bone that at first I, I was like, is this because of a reconstruction or something like that? Or, or somebody tried to glue this in or something? I, I didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, I then went to the field museum. I found this in other gorillas that were there. So these are actually two, two uh, field museum gorillas that have the same plug of bone. Um, and then uh, I worked with a student, research student, Dalia Kanani, uh, who uh, in uh, 2020 um, worked in the natural science summer research program with me uh, to look at the ulna of uh, gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans and modern humans to see if she could identify more grooves or plugs uh, like the one I saw in Bushman and the field museum gorillas. And she did a really nice job showing that uh, this feature must be somewhat related to size. So it's the larger individuals who tend to have uh, plugs, especially, and then grooves, but it also might be related to taxonomy to some extent, because for instance, there are large orangutans that are as large as, or larger even than, than male chimpanzees that do not have this groove. And so this is a feature, believe it or not, that nobody has ever studied before. And so this is a, a new discovery that we've made on the skeleton of uh, zoo gorilla and then on the skeletons of uh, gorillas that are in a museum at the Field Museum. Uh, so it's really exciting, never been studied before. Um, and then it turns out that Bushman's postcranium anyway, looks completely different from the postcranial skeleton of wild gorillas. Uh, this is a plot uh, of the first two principal components in a principal component analysis. So here's the first principal component and here's the second principal. So first principal component is along the bottom and the second pr principal component is along the side. Uh, this is a fancy way to study size and shape when there are lots of different measurements and you have to simplify variation down into just a few different axes. Um, Bushman is all the way up here, the top of the graph, and varies in a different way than do any of the wild gorillas, which are here. Um, so this is research that I worked on with uh, an undergraduate research student, Ansarine Hassan, who's now a senior health science major. Uh, she participated in the 2018 Natural Science Summer Research Program, but this is from her uh, 2019 research. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we got to the point in this research where we found this really exciting, interesting result. And then we decided we needed to look at other zoo gorillas, ones that were in cages and then ones that were kept under more naturalistic in conditions, like allowed to go outside and roam around and climb trees and things like that. Um, and then the pandemic hit and everything was closed. The field museum was closed. It's just recently opened back up for scientific research. So uh, the hope is that we get back and get the chance to complete the study to see if indeed other zoo gorillas will be up here if, if there'll be a difference between caged gorillas and, and natural setting gorillas. So the jury is, jury is still out on that a little bit, uh, but there's Bushman all the way up the top. In fact, the most interesting question is the one uh, that I just uh, was speaking about. Uh, 
this is, I think, the most interesting question that Bushman skeleton can actually answer um, is that how conditions in zoos affect skeletal morphology. So is there a difference between animals that are housed in more naturalistic conditions um, and those that are housed in steel cages, behind bars, with concrete floors. So gorillas and other animals aren't really housed that way nowadays. So they're housed usually in more naturalistic con conditions when, um, when possible. Um, and so it, it'll be possible to, to look at how differences in behavior and diet map onto skeletal changes at zoos and, and in wild gorillas as well. Um, these are the types of questions that, that Bushman can answer. The Field Museum website really sums Bushman up perfectly, I think. It reads, Bushman's unique story is one of many that enrich our understanding of the natural world and our place in it. And so that's a very aspirational thing. Uh, at the end of the day, though, after all of the scientific research is done, maybe we should scale back those aspirations a little bit and follow the wisdom of Father Ted, who was quoted in the Chicago Tribune in 1990 as saying, I would like to see a skeleton put together one day. All right, thank you. Uh, I look forward to any questions that you might have uh, and during the question and answer period later tonight. And Thank you for joining me on this journey. I'm Jean Marie Kalth. I am a professor of languages and literature here at Benedictine University. And we're here to talk about sustainability efforts um, on uh, campus. I'm Dr. Leanne Hardin. I am an assistant professor of biology at Benedictine University. And I teach uh, classes like environmental science and ecology. I'm Anne Marie Smith. I'm the writing learning specialist, and I teach classes like Writing 1102, which is um, research writing in the sciences. Dr. Tim Marin from the Department of Physical Sciences, and I teach chemistry and physics here. So we don't have a whole history of uh, sustainability on campus, but we do go a ways back among us. And um, I guess my first memory of sustainability efforts on campus is the garden. Uh, I think it was spring of 2007, I had students in the scholars program and they, some of them had never put their hands in the dirt. So they wanted a community garden and we had one. Um, first it was by where the parking garage is now, we had to move it. It's now west of Shoal and it's been a really good learning tool, not always pristine by any means, um, <laughs> but a lot of people here have helped with it and um, it's, it was a start. Um, then around 2008, there were a whole bunch of us, faculty, staff, and students who were interested in sustainability efforts, and we decided we wanted to make a big go of it. So we put together a three-year program, Years for the Environment, 2008 through 2011. And it was a whole bunch of activities. So we revised the curriculum. We brought in speakers. Um, we had themes for the different years. We did projects. We began a lot of projects that continue to this day, including um, Woods Cleanup, and then also, um, uh, you know, hunting for garlic mustard and buckthorn and, and eradicating invasive species in the woods. Um, and uh, the curricular aspects have lasted as well. We decided it was important as we reformed the general education to make sure that every student at Benedictine had at least one class that had something to do with the environment. So those S designated classes have become part of Gen Ed and that all started um, with those efforts then. It was really um, so many people involved with that. Um, and we've done, revisited the issue of environment in subsequent years and had different summer readings that focused on environmental issues. Um, so one of our best projects, I think, to come out of that uh, initiative and one that was really student-led uh, was in 2015 because of a couple students who were really pivotal um, we were able to get healthy lawns on campus. This is not an easy thing to do in the suburbs um, to get um, healthy lawns with dandelions. And we don't have all of our lawns um, not treated with pesticides. I think still there are pesticides applied to the athletic fields. That's a tougher fight. Um, but you know, we're really, we stand out from our competitors in having at least some lawns that are not treated. Um, and yeah, I'm really proud of, of what our students have been able to do. 
yes. yeah, it's been it's been fun to participate in um, the gardening as well. So it's some of my favorite, my students' favorite activities are, are kind of um, picking weeds and trying um, vegetables right from the garden. And um, actually more recently, some of my ecology lab students have selected the garden to do uh, research projects on looking at things like soil fertility and pollinator activity um, on, on that, that, uh, that little area there. So that's been kind of a fun, uh, fun uh, addition as well. Um, so I joined the Benedictine community in 2015, and I started my research at Lake St. Benedict, um, which we know kind of uh, informally is a slew, um, <laughs> and we know is is man-made, and we've got some great pictures from Dr. Marin um, showing the creation of, of the lake on campus. Um, but I have started doing uh, turtle research as a long-term uh, capture, mark recapture project on campus where we put humane uh, turtle traps and bait them with a can of sardines and um, catch turtles and we measure them and weigh them, take pictures of them and give them a unique uh, code that allows us to identify them in the future. And so I've had uh, multiple students participate in that over the summer through um, the Natural Sciences uh, Summer Research Program, but also uh, my ecology lab students and really students that are walking by, um, you know, students that are interested in the research will kind of come check it out as well. So we've caught um, over 100 painted turtles and um, close to 20 snapping turtles. There's plenty of snapping turtles around campus and uh, the police and uh, students on campus help to identify them and cart them over to uh, my lab in buckets um, so that we can make sure to weigh them and give them their, their code. Uh, before we re-release them. So um, the the campus has actually been um, what looks like a, a great uh, habitat for for turtles and a great refuge in a suburban area that is um, that has a lot of roads around it. And so it's it's a nice um, lake for for them to kind of seek um, habitat and food. And, and it seems like they're doing pretty well there. So we also have been measuring things like water quality with my research students and. Um, macroinvertebrate and fish diversity to get a really, you know, broad, comprehensive idea of how healthy our lake is and how to potentially improve it. Um, and so we've been collaborating with engineering uh, students as well for some of those projects. And so the only other thing I guess I'll add is just kind of my work with the museum itself mm -hmm. in terms of outreach and education. We started a turtle day that uh, was that ran twice. Um, and, and we'll continue to run it every fall um, once we can have folks back on campus, but um, where we have about 50 community members, anywhere from, you know, two year olds up through 80 year olds come to campus and explore how to conduct research at a lake. Um, and they'll help us to check traps and sample and all those things. So they really kind of learn a, a, an awesome hands on uh, way of, of doing science and become citizen scientists and um, so that's been uh, really rewarding as well. And I know, and all of you have helped out with, with that part as well, so. Yeah, we're both on the advisory board for the museum. Yes. Yeah, a lot, of people, a lot of people don't know that exists, but it does. Yes. Um, so that was a natural partnership, absolutely. Um, before I forget, uh, I wanna point out there's a website where you can go and find out about all the sustainability efforts on campus, ben.edu slash sustainability. Um, I need to update it, but <laughs> but it's there. Um, and I also wanted to talk about SEEDS. Uh, that's the Students for Environmental and Ecological Development, right? I always have to pause on how that goes. Um, that is a group of students that they just take on any kind of sustainability projects that they want to take on on campus. I think that the, the pesticide free kind of stemmed mm -hmm. from SEEDS. Yeah. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so they kind of petered out a little bit during COVID, but they're back again. We had a meeting uh, earlier this week and there were five students there and and they're talking about finishing up their board and, and they're gonna do a stream cleanups. We have an adopt a stream. We have adopted a bit of stream at Hitchcock Woods. You've been there with us. Yeah. And have you come to a cleanup yet? Not, yet. There? Not there, I don't think you've done. You're all welcome, of course, November 13th <laughs> at nine o'clock. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so please come. Um, you'll be getting a flyer about that pretty soon. Uh, but yeah, they've been doing it uh, long enough that we got a sign on the road that goes alongside there. So that's kind of nice. 
Um, let's see, what else? What else do I need to talk about? Faculty group? Oh, the faculty group, that's right. So these two lovely people <laughs> were involved in the staff and faculty group. I don't know what it was called back in the day, but <laughs> um, now it's, um, we're calling it the sustainability, what did we land on? Sustainability. Stewardship and sustainability committee. committee. There we yes. go, stewardship and sustainability committee. And that is staff and faculty. We haven't really had any students involved in that, but that's okay, because we have seeds. Um, but it's it's people from all different departments, staff and faculty, right? From uh, business department to academic support to literature, right? There's all sorts of different folks from all different um, disciplines that come together. We haven't since COVID, but we need to get a meeting going on that, I think. Um, but yeah, so it's another way to coordinate a lot of efforts, a lot of energy together towards efforts on campus. So I think that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, just, just a couple comments about things that are going on with uh, specifically in our department. Doc, Dr. Harden mentioned that there's some partnerships with uh, our engineering program and and that is entirely the case right there's there's interest within our our department regarding things uh related to renewable energy in general we have the uh sort of foundation uh of of what ultimately we hope is going to become what we're calling a, a the venue renewable energy lab on campus where we want to partner with uh with argonne national laboratory to have activities on campus where we you know ex explore things that are inherent to solar technology to wind technology uh, especially for battery storage purposes related related to those things and uh, uh, we've got projects uh, with Dr. Stefanowski in our department you know, Stefan Stefanowski is, is is primarily pushing um, some of these ideas that are going to be really great for outreach purposes so for instance the um, aerators on the SLU right might ultimately be driven by some solar panels that are set up over there there's a project that he has in collaboration with folks at uh, uh, Oregon Tech University uh, with with that's affiliated with a Benedictine monastery the uh, uh, Emiliwaha right in in Tan Tanzania and they're working with the sisters there basically to set up a, a big solar array that ultimately is going to power hospital and orphanage that they have on site there and so we're hoping that Ben new students can actually uh, travel to Tanzania and actually set up all of this stuff in in, in the future um, our department recently uh, just sent out a, a proposal for the gen ed curriculum so that we'll have a couple of uh, quantitative physical science courses courses in specifically renewable energy right so like a two course sequence where you learn about all of all of this stuff um, in any case, we're, it's, this is something where I think across the sciences, there's interest in, in doing all these things in addition to the service aspects of, of what we do on, on campus. And, and you know, the one thing I was just going to point out to kind of wrap, wrap this up is all of this is, is so related to our, our core institutional mission mm -hmm. as a Benedictine and Catholic institution, right? The, those, those Benedictine hallmarks that we uh, hold so so dear and sacred to us. There's one of them right in the middle is stewardship, mm -hmm. right? The in the writings of Saint Benedict, he talks about all of the everything that's in the monastery is to be taken care of as if it's sacred vessels of the altar, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that that philosophy kind of uh, reaches outside of the monastery as well to the land that it, that it occupies, right? And so there, there's this there's this oneness with um with the earth right uh and and with nature right because they they take residence in a specific place and there's that stability to being in that place and knowing that place and appreciating that place right is, is all part of this um package right not not to mention right even in, in the broader scheme of of uh, catholic social teachings especially pope francis in recent years and even pope benedict before him has been very uh very vocal about the need for uh, environmental stewardship, and especially because uh, lack of engaging in such stewardship really uh, affects the the most poor and underprivileged people in in the world before any anybody else. So it's something we want to instill in our students that it's a social responsibility for us to to do these things. Yeah, social justice. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
So to give a shout out to all the students, particularly, but staff and faculty as well, join us in the garden sometime or join seeds or the faculty sustainability group. And we pull, hope that pull, pull everyone weed. can be pull, pull a weed and pick a, and tomato. Pick a tomato. That's the model <laughs> of the garden. <laughs> no rules, no <laughs> permission. <laughs> yeah, <pet a> turtle. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much and have a great Darwin day. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Castle. I graduated in 2013 and worked at the museum all four of my years there as a student. I continued volunteering after I graduated because I loved the work in the community so much. And in 2014, I was asked to serve on the advisory board, a position which I still proudly hold. I'm currently the cataloging supervisor at Fountaindale Public Library in Bolingbrook. I don't think there's any one memory of the museum that stands out in particular, but many stories that make up an experience of a lifetime. I started as a docent during the school year, then a collections assistant during the summers, uh, where I got to explore, organize, and document the items in storage. I'm pretty sure in my time I got to handle and or inventory about 75% of the collection in storage. This is where I learned I had a love of fossils and how heavy boxes of them are, um, how to identify shells, the importance of provenance in a historical collection, and just how much care that these priceless specimens need in order to be preserved for future research. Uh, this is where I learned that I have a love of organization, documentation, education, and making things accessible to those who are searching for them, uh, which fits perfectly into my current career as a cataloger in a public library. Uh, describing the materials that the library owns so that patrons can find exactly what they need. Uh, without the museum, this part of me would not have been nourished to grow into what it has become today, because working with collections was my dream that I didn't know I had, or was even possible, until I found it at the museum. I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention a few more memories from my time at the museum, like helping clean up and organize the museum after not one, but two floods, using historical bird eggs for research at Argonne National Laboratory, traveling to STEM events at area schools, dusting the animals and performing testing on some specimens, uh, helping to design a couple of display cases, frog monitoring, helping with tours, and eventually having an idea be turned into a popular yearly event. I'm proud to have been a part of the museum's history for 13 of its 50 years now. I've seen it through so many changes and so much growth, it's, it's astounding. It has given me so much, and the least I can do is return the favor by giving back however I'm able. I hope future visitors and researchers get to experience even a fraction of what I have when they visit the gem that is the Jirikasuki Nature Museum. think of Jerika Suki Nature Museum, I think of the phrase a home away from home because that's exactly what it meant for me. I'm Hannah Rafat and I'm a graduate from the class of 2018 with a major in health science and a minor in philosophy. I am currently pursuing a master's degree to further my career in education and I was lucky enough to call the museum my home for four years. While there, I was able to take on many different roles as a docent, as a researcher, as a tour guide who has conducted thousands of different tours, and an intern. I was able to give back to the community that I once served in. I went ahead and took part in creating so many of the discovery boxes that we now have, to keeping track of the specimens, taking care of them, swapping out the collections when needed, and forming lifelong friendships, just like the one pictured here with our turtles in the annex room. But above all, the museum taught me so much about the world around us and how appreciative we should be. We came together to educate our peers and colleagues about the world around us and the wildlife that we should be grateful for. We went ahead and brought our families to the museum like I did for a bring your father, grandfather to work day, and we made countless more memories. But above all, we worked countlessly around the clock to pull off great events like Darwin Day year after year. And I was lucky enough to also take part in the internship where I worked in the conservation of the Blanding Turtles in our community. I was lucky enough to partner with professionals around our state and help these creatures get a better life. 
As you can see, these memories will last a lifetime, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Even after graduating, the museum still holds a very big part of my life. And even though on my last day, while I was very bittersweet, I am so grateful for all that I was able to take from me at the Drake Suki Nature Museum. Thank you so much for everyone that has been a part of my journey and at the journey of the Drake Suki Nature Museum. And don't forget to visit. Hi, everybody. This is Tim Marin from the Department of Physical Sciences. Wanted to uh, comment on this being the 50th anniversary of the uh, Jurika Suki Museum. Just my uh, couple of reflections on, on Father Ted. Fa Father Ted was my lunch buddy. Every day he'd, he'd come by uh, my office and I uh, wouldn't even say anything. He always make this motion like he's eating with a fork. That was the indication it was time uh, to go off to lunch. I would always be able to ask Father Ted any kind of questions about animals that if I if I happen to have something, he uh, undoubtedly had encyc encyclopedic knowledge and, and had an answer for me, if not immediately at the moment, knew exactly where to look it up. And I'd ask him all kinds of bizarre questions about, uh, oh, uh, strange animal behavior that I had just thought about or something anatomical or whatever. And he just always was so kind as to entertain my silly questions. Um, a fun memory of, of Father Ted was, uh, I think it was 2007 or thereabouts, the uh, Pancato uh, collection had just been donated uh, to the museum. And I was uh, at the university one night uh, writing up a grant proposal and Father Ted was in the process of trying to figure out where all of these various um, bits of the donation were gonna be hung throughout the building. And uh, he's going, I just kept seeing him go past my office door with one item after another, all of these uh, various creatures. And he, he paused at one point in my doorway and he's like, Tim, I think this next one may have to go in the men's room, I'm uh, I'm running out of spots. So uh, just a cute story that I wanted to recall. Father Ted was was always so dedicated. And uh, any case, it's a wonderful thing that the museum is celebrating its can, can, uh, anniversary. So congratulations. Hello, my name is Sajina Jacob. I am a Benedictine alumnus who graduated in 2021. I have been with the museum for four years in all sorts of different positions. I started out with the what was then known as Jurikasuki Nature Museum Student Advisory Board. I then went on to become a docent to help with things like field trips or other regular guided tours. And then I have also worked with the more technical aspect of things like doing research or creating worksheets for discovery boxes. And then one of the biggest projects I was a part of was helping create the digital online catalog of thousands of museum specimens we have so that everybody will be able to view them. It took a while, but our team did get it done. Some of my favorite memories at the museum have to be leading learning circles. During my first few years, we were able to hold in-person field trips for students to come in and visit. While one group was taking a tour of the museum, the other would come sit with me in our learning circle. We'd talk about our favorite animals, we'd talk about what animals live in what habitats, and eventually I would get to pass around her pelts for them to touch, and I would always get such different reactions I never knew what to expect. For the most part, they're super eager and excited. Hello. I'm Ian Martinek. I graduated Benedictine in 2016. I am currently a physics teacher and environmental science teacher at Elmwood Park High School. And I have worked at or been affiliated with the museum since I wanna say 2014 up until right now, um, because I very proudly serve on the uh, advisory board for the museum still. Um, and I'm still very proud to be a part of this institution because to to pick one memory one specific thing that that makes the museum so special to me is really hard to do um 
I want to say I've done just about everything that there possibly could be to do at the museum. I've worked as a docent. I've helped with putting together exhibits. I've done maintenance. Um, <laughs> just about, about every, I've done research through, through the museum. Um, just about everything that there possibly could be to do with this place I, I've done. Um, and all of it has been such a wonderful experience to help me in the career that I'm in right now. Being able to do lesson planning around the discovery boxes has really helped me to design engaging lessons. Um, being able to do research through the museum has opened my eyes to what real scientific practice looks like. Um, getting to interact with people every day, getting to lead tours, getting to answer questions has just, you know, it, it's one of the things that made me realize that, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to educate the public. I want to be somebody who teaches people about science. And the, the museum has been far and away the best thing that's helped shape me, you know, shape that part of my career. Um, if I had to pick one thing that really stands out, I would say the, the, the moment that it all sort of came together for me was when I was part of the team that was helping move our herbarium from the room that it was currently in to a different room. Um, and the herbarium is full of practically ancient plant samples. So you, you can't just pick up the cabinet and move it. Everything has to be taken out meticulously transferred hand delivered from one room to the other and just being able to look at these specimens and seeing that some of them are are dated from the early 1900s is just an unbelievable thing to stand there and hold that in your hand and to realize that that this leaf that I'm looking at is older than me older than my parents older than, older than my grandparents and it just you know, it, there's just something indescribable about the, being a part of that, about that feeling. Um, and there are so many moments like that working at the museum, all of the, just the, the interesting stories that come up, like every animal in there has a story behind it. And, and some of them are way more intense than you'd think just from looking at, at, you know, the different taxidermy specimens and everything, but there's just so much history there and, and it's definitely something that more people should take advantage of. Um, I, I miss that being a part of my life every day, just being able to go and pop into the museum whenever I want. Um, but, you know, we've been around for 50 years and here's to 50 more. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Talina Deem. I am a 2016 graduate from Benedictine University. I am currently pursuing a PhD in Physiology and Biophysics. A very different educational topic, but I would like to thank Carly um, for this opportunity to share my memories of the museum for its 50th anniversary. Um, this was a very challenging task um, because I have many, many memories of the museum. Um, and it's very difficult to share um, them in such a short period of time. Um, but for the time being, um, I will begin with some of my earliest memories from the museum. Um, I began working at the museum uh, at the spring of my freshman year as a docent and researcher for the Discovery Box program. And for those unfamiliar with this program, it is one which allows um, schools and early education centers to load a box. Um, which contain information pertaining to a particular group of animals, um, such as birds or bats. Um, in the context of birds, as an example, my job was to research um, different kinds of birds that exist in our environment and to compile a binder rich of information and activities um, for students at these centers to engage with and to learn more about these animals. Also through this program, I remember along with Carly and former museum member Laura Hall um, that we had visited different learning centers and science fairs to teach and excite children um, about the different diversities and animals around us. And it was truly a rewarding program to be able to see the curiosity in these young children, um, especially when it came down to identifying the different animal tracks they may find in their backyards, um, which happened to be one of their most um, favorite things to learn about and one that they could relate to as well. 
Um, my other favorite memory is from when I worked as a docent. Um, as docent, I learned um, many unique and interesting facts about the museum specimens that were always a highlight of the tours I provided. I also um, led some of the activities for spring and summer camp students, which was something I looked forward to each year um, since I had bonded with some of the returning students. And while there are um, countless other memories at the museum I have, I do remember being most um, comfortable and happiest um, at the museum. It was a wonderful break from all the coursework and other tasks I was loaded with um, throughout the years. And I can't thank Carly and Laura and all the other members of the museum for creating such a welcoming and rich learning environment for not just students at Benedictine University and other schools and programs, but for everyone, regardless of age and educational status. Um, this is a place I recommend to all my colleagues and friends to visit, and it is a place I still enjoy visiting. And I wish the museum has many more anniversaries to come. And I hope everyone here, if you have not already, really takes advantage of what the museum has to offer. Um, so thank you for providing me with this opportunity again, and happy 50th anniversary. I have many memories in the nearly 10 years that I have had the honor and privilege to serve as the director curator of the Jerika Suki Nature Museum. There are so many bright spots, too numerous to count, of the wonderful events and programs that we have been able to put on, the community outreach, and meeting so many new people. But my favorite by far is to listen and collect other people's memories. There are so many ways that our small museum touches people's hearts and minds in big ways. I love to hear from alumni who share their memories from a bygone era of having fathers Hillary and Edmund as their professors, their tales of assisting with the collection of herbarium specimens on the grounds or in the prairie fields that have now been built up as Green Trails neighborhood, or when fathers Hillary and Edmund rescued abandoned raccoon and skunk babies from the woods around Lake St. Benedict and adopted them as classroom pets. Wimpy and Snoopy are still part of our collection or that they offered extra credit to those brave students, or at least those who had the stomach for it, to collect roadkill and practice their taxidermy skills. And so many have wonderful memories of Henry, Father Hillary's cheeky capuchin monkey, also still part of our collection. Many of the teachers who visit with their classes once visited as a child themselves. They remember touring the museum when it was in Shoal Hall, and were in awe of the giant whale skeleton hanging from the ceiling, or the crocodile poised and ready to snap in the center display. They remember when the polar bear made quite a stir in the news. Apparently the students assisting in moving the bear across campus couldn't resist the opportunity for a quick jaunt down Main Street in Lyle to show off a bit. You certainly don't see a polar bear riding in the back of a pickup peeking over the cab very often. Oh, there are so many tales of the many moves of our collection has had across campus. First from Old Ben Hall into Shoal, and then from Shoal into Burke. It was a massive undertaking each time. Many also remember Bushman, the gregarious gorilla who lived at the Lincoln Park Zoo, and reminisce when they see his skeleton in our collection. And there are so many loving memories of our dear Father Ted. I only had the opportunity to get to know Father Ted for a very short time before his passing. I was able to learn the ropes from him, and he shared his vision of what he wanted the museum to be for our community. He built a strong foundation of collections care, meticulous record keeping, and along with Mary Micus, an outstanding education program. This foundation is what has allowed such growth of the museum. It set us up for the many awards we have earned, as well as the IMLS grant project we just concluded, which digitized a major portion of our collection. We couldn't have achieved these milestones without Father Ted's thorough reports and lifelong dedication to the museum. I still often find myself thinking, what would Father Ted do? Father Ted accomplished so much in his lifetime, as did the Jerika brothers before him. I am so proud to share in the rich history and dedication to the museum. We serve with our hearts and soul here. This is much more than a career. It is being part of something greater than ourselves, to serve the Bennu community and the regional community beyond. This excerpt from the museum's dedication on November 18, 1971 still rings true. Father Hillary was person-oriented, and that tradition still lives on in the museum. Every day we strive to connect with students and patrons, 
to help them understand and appreciate the natural world, to learn about all of creation and the importance of its care, to learn the mechanisms of its adaptations and evolution, and to reconnect with nature that bonds us to this wondrous and mysterious planet. Thank you all for joining us as we celebrate 50 years. Thank you to all who have helped build this museum, to form its strong connections within our community, to use the collections to teach our students, to support our programs and events, to serve as volunteers and advisors, or to champion for us from afar. We are truly humbled by your encouragement and advocacy. May we all continue to build upon the foundation laid out before us, and may we have many more anniversaries ahead to celebrate this unique gem of a museum. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we would love to hear uh, your questions um, from the, the presenters. Um, we do have several of them joining us tonight. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to um, type them in the chat um, or you can use the raise hand function um, and you can uh, take yourself off mute and ask your question. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to start um, and tell us how the um, stream cleanup went? You mentioned that in your video, and I know it was it was last weekend. Yeah, it went really well. We had inclement weather. It was a little rainy, but the students that came, I think we had probably about a dozen students who came. We found a surprising amount of garbage, even though there was a layer of leaves on the ground. Um, that worried me a little bit, but they were a tenacious group. And we had a good time. We had at least some sun throughout the day, but it went really, really well. And when I drove away, I just had this feeling of seeds is back, right? Because during COVID, it, it wasn't able to be as active as it has been, right? But it, it was the first event since the COVID lockdown. And I think it just felt really good driving away from it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking so I could kind of give an update on that. <laughs> if anybody's interested in being in seeds, may as well put a plug in. Sure. Uh, feel free feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but if you're interested, I can connect you with the president. There we go. Um, because they're they still have one more board position that they need to fill. So they would love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That's always awesome to see what you guys dredge out of there. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, our most interesting was um, I would I don't know how heavy it was, but we had one student who was determined to pull out some I don't know carpet or rug or something that was half buried in the mud, and she was determined to get it out of the mud and then haul it to the trail, and then haul it to where the pile was where the Forest Preserve District comes to pick up the trash. So we had that, and then we had um, an office chair. The top half was burned away, but the bottom half was in perfect condition. So that was another weird one. But those were our two big finds. Good. Glad they're out of there. <laughs> awesome. Well, hello. I get I got a lot of hellos in the chat. I'm really glad that we have so many people on with us tonight. This is very exciting. Um, did anyone else have any questions that they would like to pose to our our um our guests tonight, our speakers. Don't everybody volunteer at once. <laughs> I was intrigued about Bushman's story. I learned a lot from Dr. McCarthy on that because I, I grew up, you know, born in 66. So I was pretty little still when he died, but he was, he still is an icon of Chicago. And I'm so proud that the museum as a piece of him, but I learned a lot about his story that I didn't know. So thank you for that, Dr. McCarthy. I don't no, know that I have a question. I just appreciated the story. <laughs> no, no problem. Thanks. Um, I actually didn't know anything about him before moving here and before finding out he was in the museum. So I'm from the East Coast originally. I know a little bit about the gorillas that were in the Philadelphia Zoo, but I didn't know too much about uh, about Bushman and it was a little bit before my time too. So it was a, a great story for me to research and 
figure out over the past couple of years. And it's uh, really interesting. It's gotten me interested a lot in uh, uh, gorilla morphology. It's, it's not outside my usual research, but it's just a different sort of, you know, different, different route of research, which is, uh, which is really interesting. So I'm um, looking forward to working more on that, definitely. And very exciting, the new stuff that you've already uncovered. Um, I can't wait to see what else, when you guys get back into the museums, what else you discover. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So there's very, very little research on um, the different types of zoo conditions. I would say there's barely anything. There's hardly anything and, and nothing in primates. So uh, what's been done is actually been done mostly in um, large cats that are held in zoos. So like tigers and lions. Um, and that's really interesting research. And so they have modified skulls and skeletons when they're in captivity. And so it's interesting to see that that also happens in primates too. I like how you talked about the advancements too in, um, you know, I mean, just the, the difference in how they used to have zoo animals versus now where it's much more natural and it's nice to see those improvements. <laughs> And, you know, even at the skeletal level, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I'm really hope, hoping it turns out that way once we get to look at more of the, the you know, once we get to look at the, the animals kept in captivity, but under really naturalistic conditions, because some of the enclosures at the, the Brookfield Zoo and Lincoln Park Zoo are really, really advanced, um, really just like wide open spaces. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that that works out for the, uh, the skeletons of all these different primates. Um, we had a question in the chat about um, volunteering at the museum. And there, there are a lot of different ways um, to get involved with the museum um, under normal conditions, which I'm hoping we'll be able to start again next summer. Um, we have summer internships that we offer um, to students either um, who are brand new students or who are outside of our uh, main campus community. Um, so if you want to take lay research credit through your new university um, and come be an intern with us, we offer those opportunities. Um, we also have um, student workers. Um, obviously, you heard some wonderful stories from um, some uh, past student workers that we've had. Um, but we will have those opening again in uh, January, um, which would be um, you know, a great time to apply is uh, coming up for that. Um, and then volunteer work again, once we kind of get back to uh, where we're fully reopened, um, we will have more uh, volunteer opportunities as well. So um, stay, stay posted, <laughs> um, more to come. But uh, yes, I am very happy to hear that interest. Um, it's a very fun place to, to be and to help out with. <laughs> I love being part of the history, even though it's a small piece of it. You know, like when what you said at the end there, Carly, how you feel like you're continuing it as the next director curator. Um, I like that even though, even if I'm playing just a tiny, tiny role, I, I, I like that I'm part of something that goes that far back. In fact, did you it is, it's amazing how far back it goes. I mean, mm -hmm. 50 years is just since they dedicated the museum, the collection, um, you know, I mean, when they started collecting was, you know, well back and Tim, Maren, you can jump in here because you're writing a book about the, <laughs> all of the science here. So you you know a lot more than I do about when all of these kind of things started. But I mean, this collection, um, like as its its own assemblage has existed for well over 100 years. Um, and then, you know, obviously a lot of our specimens are, are over 150 years old. So it's amazing that um, all of these different things came you know, to our collection and that we've been able to, to care for them and preserve them for this long. Like it's, it's just amazing as a small institution that we have this breadth of a collection. It's, it's wonderful. Carly, if, if you could enable screen sharing, this oh, yeah. might be interesting since you mentioned it. I was just going through my stuff. I found the oldest photo that I could come up with of the stuff that used to be the collection when it was housed in Ben Hall before this was a museum proper. Oh, cool. I, I think I gave you, does that work? Hold on, yes, <laughs> here you go. Oh my gosh, 
So this is, um, from what I can tell, around 1926. Wow. Um, this was in Old Ben Hall. It was in the south end of the building. There was a room on the on the third floor, and this was referred to as the Bugs Lab, because apparently originally they used this for uh, an entomology lab, and it gradually became filled with all of the different species. And if you kind of look carefully, you can see the heron up yep. here, and so <laughs> like there's there's a few critters in this photo that are like still like front and center in various regions of the collection in the museum today right and this is nearly 100 years ago um interesting uh a tidbit of this if you look right in the middle at the top and the ceiling you see this black square so this apparently was a little door that opened up and there was a dumbwaiter that um, went through the ceiling and up to the fourth floor where there was a storage area where they kept uh, the majority of the collection, right? It was up actually in storage space and not on display. And apparently when uh, Father Hillary would be doing class, he, he was known as a really affable, jolly, kind of silly character. And apparently he had this song that he would sing. He would, he would climb up in the dumbwaiter and go up into the ceiling and sing this little song like Father Hillary is going up to heaven or something like this. And he'd go up in the ceiling, grab the animal for the day, come back on the dumbwaiter and come back down and say, Father Hillary's coming down from heaven, right? And he'd have the animal of the day like to show the class and they would do their comparative anatomy stuff thereafter. But that is the uh, famous door in the bugs lab through which apparently he would do that also in the front of the room it's kind of blurry and out of focus here this is actually one of the uh the Jurica charts like right in the the front of the room so anyway just just thought i'd i'd share that picture and that yes this picture actually will be in that book when it comes awesome. up that's wonderful i've never seen that that's amazing <laughs> I do recognize some of those specimens though. <laughs> yep. Very cool. <laughs> and Phil, it was great for you to talk about all the research too. Um, I know you've been very involved in several parts of the collection um, and highlighting Dr. Tischler's research too. That's that's been wonderful. Well, I'm really excited about the the digitization. So there's there's so many historical specimens, and I didn't realize the connection that the fathers were on the board of the field museum. I knew there was a lot of trading going on, but I know you had mentioned some of the specimens that started the field museum was the, the Columbian World Exposition. And we have some of those specimens on display. And as all the museums are digitizing their collections, at some point we'll be able to find all the provenance and kind of resurrect kind of the original full collections and know where all the pieces are. And, and that, that's one of the things that I think is really exciting about really all the museums is, is there's so many wonderful things stored and as they become more accessible and more widely known, there's just so much more research we can do and take advantage of those things, looking for kind of the weird little gems that we didn't know existed, but might be close by, they might be far away, but they're all now accessible where before, they were only known if you knew about them um, or knew somebody who knew about them, so. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's so much opportunity for research. Um, and we have a, a question in the chat about, you know, looking at some of these things at a cellular level. Like, I know there's been very limited research on the collection um, and I'm very much hoping that the uh, kickoff that we've had to digitize uh, a lot of the collection. I mean, we have um, 3,317 discrete records on Arctos now, um, and that represents a little over 10,000 individual specimens because like the eggs are grouped by clutch and things like that. Um, and that is just, it's been amazing to have those up and fully imaged and, and documented um, and have our students, you know, go through and read those catalog cards and learn cursive. <laughs> um, we've had a lot of training in how to read these old catalog cards and, um, you know, interpret historic documents and, and put all of those things into um, our amazing online data portal now so that uh, all of that information is up and out. Um, and we actually um, 
just signed on to um, disseminate all that information through GBIF. So um, it's going to be even wider um, in our, our reach and dissemination to scientists worldwide. So um, I'm very excited <laughs> to see um, kind of where that goes and, and tracking, you know, what other research project we might be able to um, help, you know, help contribute to and, and um, see how those specimens are used in the future. Um, and now, uh, currently, we're working on digitizing the herbarium, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, we have a, a grant to do that um, through May. Um, and we, we don't have the full inventory of that collection, so we are creating it as we go. Um, we estimate there's uh, over about, or between four and 6,000 uh, specimens in that collection. Um, and uh, uh, we have one full cabinet uh, that is um, the original Jerica collection um, from the grounds and uh, the areas around um, the, the university. Um, and part of that is, you know, a survey of where like Green Trails neighborhood is and, and places that have been built up and to, to document those areas that you, you know, you can't go see what it was like, but you, you know what was there, um, you know, in, in the late 1800s. Um, that's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and uh, Anne Marie, you're, you're right. Um, I know um, we had the Morton Arboretum come out to assess it to see, you know, what they thought of the collection before we started that project. Um, that was exactly what they said is um, you have a snapshot of the, you know, the, what has happened in climate change since, you know, 1870. Um, in that area. And that's an amazing collection to have um, and to have it documented through the decades too. Um, I mean, they, could, they collected until um, at least the mid seventies actively in those areas. So um, it's a very unique collection and I'm excited to get it up and out of our basement <laughs> um, in a safe way <laughs> by digitizing it. Um, and, uh, you know, really conserve that specimen data in a, a very new, a way for us, um, it's a big step forward for, for our whole collection. Um, and that was really, I mean, Father Ted laid all of that foundation. Um, he had uh, several grants where we had um, uh, several people, even the, the Smithsonian um, uh, curator came in to do an assessment of our collection um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and those documents set us up for the grants that we've been able to get for that. So very grateful for all of the work before to lay the foundation for what we've been able to do now. Uh, along those lines, one of the things that I think a lot of people kind of take for granted is, is you have all these specimens, why aren't they all being used? Um, and it's kind of like a library. library. The, the, the recent popular top 10 stuff is, is very actively being read but most of the stuff isn't, but it's all accessible. It's all there and it might take a long time for somebody to use it, but when they use it, it's, it's for an important reason. Um, the, the specimens that I was working with one, with one of the Benedictine students, I'm pretty sure hadn't been touched since the early 1800s. It had just been stored in a, a field museum drawer and I didn't know who collected it until I researched it and checked out the, the history. And you could find the description of that specimen in a publication in 1838 published in Canada um, and had just been collecting dust. But 150 or close to 200 years later, it, it has this use that no one originally expected. And, and just because no one's used it for really even a century doesn't mean it's, it's not really valuable for future stuff. I mean, a lot of it is just store it or whatever comes in the future so that it's available. And that's really valuable, even though it's a long, slow fuse, um, but it, it has power down the road for things we can't even imagine today. And and gathering whatever evidence we can today, you know, I mean, yeah. it's Absolutely. to look back and, and see, you know, what can we glean from it now and then preserve it for the future. Just right, like for that, sure. who, knows, who knows why we'll need it later. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's always, I'm always in awe because when we, you know, when we work down in the collections area, um, I mean, it's packed in <laughs> um, and nobody gets to see that, you know, and that's the, the kind of hard sell in any museum is you need a lot of time and effort and money to, to protect all of those things and to care for them. And, 
um, to properly store them in archival materials. And we're continuously <laughs> upgrading and, and trying to uh, make sure everything is, um, you know, got its own space and is organized. Um, and it gets complicated when you have, you know, 30,000 things in the basement <laughs> and you need to know exactly where everything is at any given time. Um, but it's also, I'm just always in awe. And I always try to take a moment when I'm down there because all of those things were living beings at one time. And to think about that, like to think that each of those things had their own lifetime. And then now we're trying to preserve them so that they can be studied during someone else's lifetime is really amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, like uh, Ian, you know, keyed in on when he was holding, you know, a, a, one of those herbarium specimens, you know, some of our oldest specimens um, from the 1800s or the early 1900s and, and thinking about the perspective of putting it in the timeline of your own life <laughs> um, and kind of where you fit into that whole puzzle of life. Um, it really does help you take pause. <laughs> Um, and I love those moments. I love when my students have those moments. You know, I mean, I think we all need to see the bigger picture and take a step back sometimes. And, and this collection definitely helps you do that. <laughs> and yeah, in the chat, I see um, Anne-Marie mentioned our Jerika charts. Um, that was also part of our um, grant project. Um, those, those, they were big flip charts. Um, and they were hand illustrated by the Jerika brothers and their students. Um, we have over 600 of them in our collection and they were all hanging on the original wooden, uh, uh, it's like a board that goes across with a hanger and metal um, like bolts that go through them. Um, and when you're trying to conserve museum specimens, you don't want metal and wood and canvas to mix, <laughs> especially not for a hundred years. Um, so, you know, the bolts are rusty, the wood is acidic. So we wanted to separate those things. Um, and instead of having them hanging, we wanted to lay them flat so that they could actually rest <laughs> um, and, and flatten out and be, um, and be usable. Um, because in their, in their current um, way that they were hanging, we really couldn't even see what was there and they were kind of curling on the edges. And so that IMLS grant actually bought us a very fancy flat file storage system. Um, that all of the um, Jerika charts were then uh, pressed flat uh, in a very gentle manner um, to help ease out all of those wrinkles and curls that they've had over the last hundred years. Um, and then and get them into a filing system um, where we could actually um, use them. <laughs> um, and, and yes, um, so they were actually in the background of E.T. I don't know if they were in Fer Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but they were in a movie. Um, they were in the back of the E.T. movie when they were in the classroom um, space. And they have been used in, in several different things. Like they, are, they, are, they have a pop culture presence. <laughs> um, and especially right now, they're kind of coming back into um, you know, favor just as, as decoration and things like that. But they're very useful. Um, and they're, they were kind of like the PowerPoint so that they yeah. day, right? yes. like you could just flip them and go to the next slide. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, kind of like those giant maps and things like that that you used to have, like these were huge anatomical drawings. Um, and you, you know, you'd buy a, a classroom set. Um, they were also published in textbooks and um, really, you know, at the time um, were uh, so leading, you know, the Jerika brothers during the summers would lead um, seminars and, and schools from around the nation would send their professors to learn how to do that kind of thing, you know, because it wasn't just reading out of a textbook, it was really getting your students engaged um, and, you know, teaching them taxidermy and, and getting them out into the field. And, you know, at that time that was, um, it was rare um, and people wanted to know how to do it to engage their students. Um, so we've always been very leading in the way that we've taught science uh, at, at Benedictine, which is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think in the dissection scene, Phil, <laughs> in, the, in the movies, they're in the background of, of several movies, yeah. So Dr. McCarthy, are you gonna continue to have students help you with research? Can you and Dr. Marin and Dr. Novak Godchuk, can you talk about how students can get involved in research? Yeah, I, I am. And, uh, you know, one thing that I found, uh, you know, the pandemic was hard on everybody. But uh, just, you know, correlating with a lot of what people have said here, is that one of the great things that came out of it was that 
I found that you could have students work on projects and use uh, use specimens from museums that have been digitized or CT scanned or laser scanned and put up on the web from the Smithsonian and uh, other, especially the Smithsonian, but other museums around the world. And it's become a smaller world, but much easier to do groundbreaking research because of the way that museums, you know, have, have become integrated into the modern world. So it's really a great opportunity to you know, you don't necessarily have to go to Washington, D.C. You want to, right, because it's so nice and you get to look in the museum, but a uh, student doesn't necessarily have to go there to, to collect data on specimens. They can collect data on digital specimens. And so a lot of what uh, I'm doing is shifted then to that type of, type of research, especially over the past two years. Yeah. All the faculty who, who do research have their own kind of policies. Sometimes it's kind of you have to have a certain course kind of as a like a prerequisite. Um, other times it's you just ask. Um, and really, it's just one of those things you just ask faculty if you're interested in the stuff they're doing and see what's available. And and we we want students to be doing research. We want awesome students doing research with us. And it's really just kind of asking and and trying to find that right fit at the right time. How do they know what you guys are doing? Isn't there a, a link somewhere? Can one of you put it in the chat? I can't remember where it is. I know it's on the science side, but I don't know exactly which page. I think it's I being re, re imagined at this point. But oh. Okay. I, 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 a lot of it is kind of just the stuff we teach um, by and large. Um, usually we're teaching the things that we like to do and that we you know might not necessarily do research in everything we teach in um, or vice versa um, or we don't get to teach everything we do research in but usually there's a, a pretty good fit um, and so if if you're interested in anatomical things dr mccarthy is going to be a good choice um, if you're interested in like invertebrate animals um, and especially fossils i'm a good choice if you're interested of the physics of water, uh, Dr. Marin's going to be a, a good choice. Um, if you're interested in museums and museum specimens, um, Mrs. T is going to be a good choice. It, it's really just kind of getting to to see what everyone's teaching and and kind of going from there a lot of the time. And we actually do have um, up to three research positions open next semester um, because some of our students are graduating early. <laughs> Um, and we're still trying to wrap up the herbarium um, digitization project. Um, so feel free to reach out if you're interested um, in helping. Uh, we're processing the specimens as we go also. So we're putting the barcodes and the um, museum name stamp on them, on our nameplate. Um, and then we will be um, transferring the data uh, in. So, you know, database management and things like that. So lots of different skills you can learn with us next semester as well. Um, I put the museum website in the chat. If you're interested, please reach out to me. You know, I, I should also say that there is a formal uh, research program. I hope you figured that out from my presentation where I said the name of it like 1,200 times, uh, the, the Natural Science of Summer Research Program. Um, and so uh, the applications for that, oh, I have to think about when they come out. But usually they're due in March. March, right. So it's like halfway through the spring semester. But uh, you would apply for position there and then there, there's many different professors that are doing different kinds of research uh, you know and and so a lot of students at, at that point then can get an opportunity to do research during the summer which is a, a really great program so there's some some funding to do that and and uh, lots of professors that do that as well oh, there you go dr Novak gotcha I'll put it in the in the chat And here natural refers to really all the sciences, including math, computer science, um, really very broad. For Nadine's question, um, I think it really just depends on um, who you're working with and what the project is that they're currently working on. Sometimes there's museum stuff involved, sometimes there isn't. Um, it's just going to be on a case by case basis. A great question. So the bottom line is don't be afraid to ask professors about research. <laughs> the opportunities are there, absolutely.
Also, the I have the a other friend. thing I was going to add to that, you could just there, there's and Marie Smith mentioned, you know, is there some place where you can look up everybody's projects? And I would say like the best place to look is just the every individual faculty member has their personal faculty profile page, right, which describes not just your teaching duties, but recent publications, grants that you got. And, you know, you get a flavor of what the person's research interest is on our individual faculty pages. So you can learn about who to sign up for there. Dr. Novak Gottschall could even sign up for research with me and learn how that big electricity ring thing works. <laughs> yeah, you, I hope I didn't totally butcher that. <laughs> of course you did, but buy me a beer, I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in. Do Dr. Yeah, Mack, you, have, you have to tell us, is it electricity running through that thing? Like yeah, Dr. Uh, you know, we'll just we'll just let that slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Better than saying ice cream goes around it or something. That's for sure. <laughs> well, ice cream's got interesting physical properties. It's it's not a solid. It's not a liquid. It's not really quite a gel. So. <laughs> Oh, any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This is a wonderful program. Um, don't forget that tomorrow night uh, at five o'clock, um, that's five o'clock central time, um, we will uh, join on the other Zoom link. Um, and um, we have um, our distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Dr. J. Drew Lanham joining us. Um, and he will be live for the Q&A session as well. So please bring your questions. Um, join us for the keynote lecture um, and the program following. So thank you again uh, for joining us tonight. I hope you have a very good evening um, and see you at uh, Darwin Day tomorrow as well. <laughs>